Thanks for coming. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, what every develop web developer should know about database optimization. So, how many of you are web developers? How many of you are DBAs who want to teach your web developers something? <laughs> Nobody. Good. All right. Let's see. All right. Um, just real quick about me. I have about 14 years experience. Uh, web, I've done web development, uh, system administration, database administration, networks. Just about, I've, I've done just about everything. Um, mostly with uh, MySQL. So that's kind of where my, uh, some of my uh, focus has been. So I uh, apologize, I don't have as much. Uh, most of the stuff we're going to talk about today is general. It can apply to any database. Uh, but this is you know, my experience, at least, is with MySQL. So, what's those down your web page? Um, content load time. Uh, who uses like YSlow and Firebug, those kinds of things? Yeah, you know, those are things. Those are tools you use to to worry about you know static content and how it's loading. That's not what we're going to talk about today. Poorly optimized code. Um, my experience, I've had, uh, is I, I do a lot with uh, scalability, so scaling you know, large websites. Um, and I've had three times in my career where poorly optimized code was a scalability problem. Uh, generally, it's the database. Your database is gonna be where you're gonna have scalability problems. Now your code might be a little slow, but it's usually not going to take down your whole site. Um, like I said, I've, I've had that happen three times. Uh, one was uh, regular expression gone bad, which say, I, don't, I don't know if you've heard the saying, if um, some, some people think, you know, when they see a problem, they think, oh, I can solve that with a regular expression. And now they have two problems. So <laughs> uh, another one was object creation gone on rapid, so those are unusual. Generally, on web sites, if you're getting scalability problems, load problems, it's going to be your database. So uh, we're going to talk about some specific cases, uh, specific things that are going to cause scalability problems. Uh, first, we're going to talk about poorly indexed queries. Uh, so there are different things you can have with with poorly indexed queries. One, can you, you can have too few indexes. Uh, if you don't have enough indexes, then your queries will run slow. Um, now, everybody knows that, though. That's, that's one of the things DBAs, uh, one of the things they find with uh, people who don't know as much about uh, databases. Everybody knows that all you have to do is add an index, and that'll fix all your problems. Um, that's not necessarily the case. If you have too many indexes, then your writes will be slow. And it may not even solve your problems. It may not solve the problems with the reads, but too many indexes, because every time you write to your database, it has to re-index. So the more indexes you have, the longer it takes to update all those indexes. Um, another thing, this kind of goes along with too many indexes. You can get redundant in indexes. And we'll talk a little bit about how that can happen. Uh, but it's pretty easy to get uh, a case where you have two indexes basically doing the same thing. So uh, we need to, to do proper indexing. So uh, first thing, who, who's used a composite index where an index is over multiple fields? Okay, well those are very good, it's a very good thing to know. Um, but you have to know that the order, of, uh, the order of the fields in your index is important. It's going to read your index left to right. So the first field is going to be the one that it's going to read first. So if you don't specify the first field, it won't use the rest of your index. The rest of your index is worthless. 
So I've seen people just make an index across all of their fields and expect that to solve all their problems. But what's really happening is it's never using the index because they're not specifying the first column in their index. Um, so indexes are going to be used, uh, first of all, if you're, um, especially with composite indexing, so if you have multiple fields in your index, uh, so I, one, another example I've seen, uh, this was fairly recently, uh, they had a latitude and a longitude column. Now they were putting in points in their database, so they had latitude was a float, longitude was a float, they had an index across the two columns. And then they're looking for anything that fits inside a box. They're doing a viewport and wanting to find uh, all of the, all the points that fell within that viewport is for mapping thing. So uh, what ended up happening was on the first column of the index, the latitude, they were giving it a range. So the latitude, they were saying from here to here, we want everything from here to here. And then on longitude, they were saying from here to here. Well, once you put a range in, it can't use the rest of your index. Because the index is going, if you, if you give it a specific value, then it can go on to the next part of your index. But if you give it a range, it just, the whole index just, you know, it, they can't do anything with that. So you need to know when your index is being used and when it isn't. Um, if you're using, you know, you have to give it, to get really good stuff, you want to uh, give it a, you know, an exact value. In some indexes, if you have a hash index, then it only works on exact values. You know, range queries will, won't use that index. So what you want to do, um, you want to focus on uh, indexing things that will reduce the size of your data set that's coming back. So especially when you're getting into joins. Um, but with your where's, you want to index things so that you're reducing as quickly as possible. So for example, um, if you've got a, a multi-table join, you want to, on that first table in that join, you want to have as few rows returned as possible. Because the fewer rows you have, the fewer rows it has to worry about joining with the next table. And so you'll get a lot more value with indexing on the first table than you will by indexing on the second table. And the second table is only going to be indexed on the actual join condition. And so um, that's something that's useful. I know uh, this is something I... I'm not sure if Postgres lets you do this. I, I know MySQL lets you do this, and I'm not a big fan of it, but where you can just specify your join clauses in the where clause. Uh, it's, it's a lot better to specify your join, what, what the conditions of your join are in the actual join clause so that you can see, it's a lot easier to come in and, and see what's happening with your uh, query. Um, so the order of tables, sometimes I've seen where it doesn't really matter to you which table comes first. The way the join is working, it could go one way or the other. Look at which one you'll be able to narrow down the most to the, the fewest rows returned. And that should be your first table. And then join against the next one, if that's possible. It might not be possible in all cases, but if it is, that's the best way to handle it. Um, so what are the filters? That's what's narrowing it down. Are there filters you can add that will help your database know, uh, give it some hints and give it, get it able to, to uh, bring that down as quickly as possible? Um, and like I said, arranging the table order. Yes? So don't modern query planners make the order of the tables in the SQL irrelevant? Yes and no. Um, they can. So uh, I know MySQL will reorder your tables if it can. So it'll look at it and determine. But sometimes you know, and you know your data better than the database does because you understand it. You understand what all the tables are, what the data inside them is. It just knows, all it knows is what the indexes are and what you've told it about the table. So you understand it better, and so you're able to make those decisions better. 
Don't just assume that your database will magically, you know, figure out the best way to do it. It'll try, and they do a very good job, but they don't always get it right. It's better to plan ahead and try to figure out, because like I said, you know better. You know better than it does. Um, so these are some, uh, some of these are MySQL specific. There's, uh, there's other types of indexing. I mentioned hash indexing. Uh, you know, instead of your standard B tree index, a hash index uh, just applies a hash function to it. Um, and it lets you go, if you're doing one-to-one uh, -one lookups, it's great. For anything else, it's worthless. Um, full text indexing uh, on MySQL, at least, I would recommend you never use that. It's, or there are better ways to do full te text indexing. If you really need it, there, it's only supported under MyISM. Um, although I've heard they're doing it in NODB and 5.6. Uh, but full text indexing, there's there's search and uh, search uh, things that you know Sphinx, Solar, Lucene, any of those will do a lot better job generally than the uh, one built in. Uh, geometric indexes, uh, in this one case where I was, I was explaining with the latitude and longitude, what we eventually did was we actually, rather than putting it in as latitude and longitude, we put it in as points. You can actually, there's a point type that you can specify in MySQL. And then you can put an index on it, um, and then you can say, here's a box. Tell me everything, all the points that are in that box. And it has an index that'll support that. Again, that's only in MyISM. Um, it's not supported in other ones. Uh, the, I know Postgres has a lot of, uh, a lot better uh, GIS support. If you're going to use the uh, geometric support um, in MySQL, I'd recommend probably using MariaDB at this point because uh, the geometric functions in the stock MySQL don't work very well. Um, they don't do what they claim to do. So there's basically you can give it arbitrary polygon shapes and you can say find all the points within this arbitrary polygon, and what it really returns is the minimum bounding rectangle, all the points within that. So it'll return points that aren't within the shape that you defined. And so I don't recommend it. Um, another thing you can do is to pre-cache information. Sometimes indexing just isn't going to help. Sometimes your query just sucks, and there's really no way to to get around it. There's, you know, you've got some kind of query that's going on, some kind of reporting generally, that it just takes a long time. Uh, what I've done in that case uh, is just have a cron job that runs, you know, sometimes the information is only needed once a day, sometimes it's needed hourly or whatever, but I just have a cron job that runs that pre-populates some table, uh, a reporting table, and that takes care of it for you. Um, so, suboptimal queries. Uh, full table scans. A uh, full table scan is when basically no index is used. That means that the database has to look at every single row in the table. Sometimes that's inevitable, but most of the time you should never see that. Uh, large joins. If you've got lots of tables or you're doing things where you're joining, you know, basically um, when you're looking at a, a, a join, your first table in the join can have multiple rows returned. But the second table, for each row in that first table, if, the, if that doesn't map to a single row in your second table, then you're probably doing something wrong. Now if you use MySQL, uh, do the explain. Uh, just, just put explain before your select statement and it will tell you, uh, you want to look at the cardinality and it'll show you for each table and you want, after the first table, you want the cardinality to be one. Um, and that means that you know, the second and third table are just, it's quickly, it's able to quickly pull those in. It's not, because um, if you have more than one, then it's having to match up 
uh, lots of rows. So for each of those, and what it's telling you, the number it gives you for cardinality is how many times, how many rows it's going to get for each row in your first table. So if you've got a thousand rows in the first table, and the cardinality is, uh, you know, three, then it's going to get 3,000, have to look up 3,000 things in the second table. If it's 20, then you're looking at 20,000. And that can grow, especially if you have that going into a, a third table or fourth table. Um, that can get very large very quickly. <laughs> so the... Another problem with uh, suboptimal queries is just that it's impossible to index. Some things just really are, there's no good way to index them. People are doing certain queries. I worked for a, a, a site that did dating, like dating sites for more niche. It wasn't like match.com or anything. But they had people doing all sorts of arbitrary queries on the database. The customers have come and they want to search based on all sorts of whatever they wanted to search on. So what do you do for that? You can't really index everything to get you know, a perfect thing. You just kind of had to figure out the best way to deal with it, narrow down, uh, find ways to narrow down as much as you can before it had to go look at all those rows. So if you can get it to narrow down to 10,000 rows and then it has to look at each one of them, that's a lot better than having to look at a million rows. So try to find ways to at least get it down as much as possible before it has to do the hard work. Um, so where filtering, uh, ensuring the indexes are used as much as possible, join order. Um, talked about that. And uh, caching the heck out of it. Do the expensive stuff. And this is another thing, um, you know, when we had these expensive queries, we put them somewhere. We didn't make, when you went to page two, we weren't doing the query again. <laughs> when we, we did the query once and put that in a search table and then, you know, a search results table. And then when you went to page two, all we were doing was looking up in that search results table. So that's how a, a lot of, I mean, some of the bigger, uh, I've, like if you've gone to like Travelocity or something, you know, you'll see that when, when you do a search, sometimes it'll take a while for that first initial search. But then once you get there, you can go between pages, you can reorder, you can do whatever you want. And it's not taking that same length of time again because they've already got all that information stored somewhere and they're just displaying it rather than going and looking it up again. So sometimes the problem is you have too many queries. Um, have you ever done a query inside a loop? Or you have queries where, have you ever found code where the same query is happening in five different places? Because they don't realize that you already got that information. Um, sometimes it'll happen just because different developers are working on it. They don't realize what some other developer did and, you know, the information is just already there. Uh, sometimes I've seen places where a query is used and then no one ever actually uses the information. Uh, presumably in these cases, it was used at some time and then some code was pulled out, but the query is still happening. Um, so how do, you, how do you fix that? Uh, instead of looping through and making uh, multiple queries, doing a single query and getting all the information and then looping through the results is a lot easier on your database. Um, eliminating redundancies, you know, there are things you can do to make sure that you're only getting the commonly accessed data, make sure you only get it once. Uh, and then, again, cache it. Store the relevant information, like their user information, store it in their sessions, store it somewhere. You know, and we're not talking about just on a single page. Uh, sometimes, you know, I've seen sites where uh, every time, on every page, uh, you're, you know, they're re-getting a whole bunch of information out of the database. And that's not very uh, efficient. You've got a session, store it. Okay. 
Who uses an ORM? Does everyone know what an ORM is? Anyone not know what an ORM is? It's a object object relation model. Is that the right mapping? Okay, I've heard it. I've heard both. So, you're, if you use an ORM, just under you have to understand that it hates you. Well, more specifically, it hates your database. Um, hopefully, if you got a modern ORM, some of the older ones were a lot worse at this, but the modern ones are a little better. Uh, but hopefully, it caches stuff. So, like if you get the same information more than once, it'll actually realize that it already got that information. Um, hopefully, uh, again, it would help to make sure you know to put stuff in sessions and you know make sure that you're not going back and getting the same information on every page. Uh, they like to make uh, lots of queries. They're chatty. They love to talk to your database. Um, your ORM, it's doing stuff. You have to understand what your ORM is doing. Is really what it comes down to. Because it'll do stuff. It's it's very easy as a developer to use an ORM because you don't even have to think about the database. You're just look. You're just using the ORM, and it's doing stuff for you. It's great, right? But it's still talking to the database. You still have to understand if you want to scale your application well. You have to understand what it's doing. And so you can't just assume that it's going to take care of everything, and everything will be great. Um, and it doesn't know how to make the optimal joins so it can get more information all at once rather than making multiple queries. You have to tell it. Now most uh, ORMs, you can tell it, but you have to tell it. Again, you know the same thing that applied to the query optimizers. You know your database better than your ORM does. You know the data. And so you know the best way to make that happen. Um, and a lot of times I've seen ORMs that get information that they never use. That's one, they're getting stuff all the time. They just, you know, put, they like to suck in tons of information. So how do you tame your ORM? Um, there are some tools that'll help you with that. Uh, if you're on MySQL, uh, the Percona Toolkit is something I highly recommend. Uh, it's, you can download it for free from their website. Uh, they have tons of tools in there. Uh, this, one, this particular one is called PT Query Digest. Uh, you can give it, it operates in a few different ways, um, but you can, for example, you can uh, run TCP dump and just dump the actual packets going to your database and then give it to PT Query Digest and it'll go through those packets and figure out what all the queries are. It'll group them by which ones and tell you which ones are happening most often and taking the most time. Um, so that'll help you get to know. And there are other ways. I mean, you can add some logging code or you know, other ways to, to figure out what's really happening. Um, but you need to know what queries are happening. Uh, otherwise, you can't fix it. So use uh, ORM features. So. Like I said, the ORMs have features that will allow you to you know, bulk load your data, bring it all in at once, or to specify join conditions. Uh, you know, I want to get this data and bring in the stuff from this table. Um, and if you do it wrong, it'll actually do it. You know, there are different ways to do it, so you have to understand that. And so some ways it will basically loop through and get the data one at a time from the second table. In other ways, it'll get it all, all at once. So you have to understand what the best way for your ORM, what the best way to get that data out is. How do you feel about complex object graphs? Um, what do you mean? Well, when, when, you're, when you're specifying for your ORM what your joins are, like for example, say a person class contains a collection of addresses. Right. And, and you specify how to join to get those addresses. So building an object graph in that way. Right. Well, overly complex object I mean, you have to have you have to understand the trade-offs between, you know, th there's efficiency and scalability and maintainability and readability, and those are always 
it, you know, there's going to be uh, tension between those because you know you can optimize your code. You know, writing it all in assembly is going to be the most optimal way to you know get the most out of your code. But you know, nobody does that because it's you know a pain to maintain. And so you have to understand, you know, just understand the trade-offs. Um, know who's going to be looking at your code. And, you know, sometimes you have to do things in a less than optimal way just because otherwise no one will have any idea what it's doing. If you are going to do something, if it, if it is important to do that, document it really well. Uh, what That's Yeah, and you have to, I mean, as long as you understand what the, what query is that generating, and you can look at, um, well, what's that, what's that query generating? You can use explain tools um, to figure out what is it doing? Um, how is it using the indexing? You know, it, there's nothing inherently wrong with complex queries. Well, it's not the complex query. Yeah, but that, I mean, when you're getting all that, pulling all that stuff in, there's nothing inherently wrong with it. You just have to make sure it's doing it in a way that is optimal for the database. So you have to understand what's going on. You have to understand what, what the ORM is actually doing that you're not seeing. And so make sure you, under, you, know, you have ways to debug what queries are actually happening. And take a look at them and see, you know, see if there's ways. And you, if you can figure out, well, by changing it around, I can make it faster. Then you can look at your uh, in your code and see how you can reorder stuff in there to make it work better. Um, sometimes it just makes sense to bypass the ORM and write your query yourself, or get someone you know who's better at writing queries to write it. Okay. Too many writes. <laughs> um, so sometimes people are doing lots of little writes. Sometimes people are doing big updates. Um, so how do you how do you deal with that? You know, if you've got a website that's, you know, one one of the problems like with this dating website I had, we were keeping track of every time someone logged in, every time, you know, we had a little thing running that would keep track of when they were online. And so it was every minute, it was reposting something back to our database or to our website saying, hey, I'm still online. Just a little iframe thingy. Um, actually, it was an Ajax thingy. So, you know, that was having to be written all the time. So how do you reduce that write impact? Um, first of all, if you're on MySQL and you're using MyISOM, stop. Just don't use it. There's, there's almost no reason to use it unless you have specific reasons. You know, like if you have to use the geometric indexing, I'd probably keep the important data somewhere else and use a cache table that has the geometric indexing, um, you know, a copy of your data. Because you're not, my ISOM isn't crash safe and it has all sorts of problems as you try to scale it. So with NODB, you can do concurrent writes and reads, you know, multiple writes at the same time, um, scales a lot better. Uh, it's a little bit, you know, on, on certain cases, it's a little bit higher load, but it scales way better because it can allow those uh, multiple things happening at the same time. Uh, you don't have the table lock problem where you can't, uh, you can't read from the table because somebody's, and th this is something with my ISIM, if you're using it, um, if, you're, if you've got a read going on that's taking five, you know, 10 seconds or whatever, and somebody wants to write to the database, another query comes in that wants to write, that query takes precedence over anything else later. And so any reads that come after that, even though you know, no write is actually happening on the database, any reads that come after that can't happen until that write that slipped in has finished. And so, and the write has to wait for the other read to be finished, and it's taking a while. You know, maybe it's taking a couple of minutes, maybe you're doing something crazy. Um, that's why you gotta be careful about those. 
So InnoDB gets rid of a lot of those problems. You don't have table locks. Uh, it's, you, know, you can get deadlocks. You'll see that it basically, um, if, if two queries are gonna, you know, they're dependent on each other, you have a circular dependency, tries to detect that, um, and it'll eventually just, it does it by timing out eventually if it's still waiting for it to acquire a lock. And so it's possible, um, but it's a lot more efficient and a lot more scalable. They don't work on my ISOM. They don't do, you know, they're not working on scaling my ISOM. They're working on scaling InnoDB. Uh, in in 5.5, five, uh, InnoDB is the default storage engine. Um, they're not working, you know, the, all they're working to, you know, multiple cores. You know, MySM doesn't, you know, it's, you're basically ending up with a single core that you're using, which nobody's using single core databases, you know, for the database servers anymore. So, um, batch your writes. So don't write everything all at once. Sometimes it makes sense. Uh, what we did with our logins and our, you know, who's online, we didn't care if the information was up to the second. It was okay if it was a minute out of date. So we just put it somewhere for a minute and then put them all in at once. That's one thing MySQL is great at, is inserting tons of data all at once. Um, you can also do, if you're updating, uh, there are ways to do uh, updates, multiple row updates as well. Uh, you can do the insert on duplicate key update, if that works for you, or there's ways to do, um, you know, I've sometimes I'll actually insert a whole bunch of stuff into one table, and then you can do a multi-table update to update from one table to the other if you don't want the side effects of doing the insert on duplicate key update. Um, Handler Socket is a great thing. It was written by a game company in Japan. Uh, it's, it's specific to, my, uh, to MySQL. Uh, so Handler Socket is a NoSQL access to your InnoDB tables. And so you can, you know, they've been able to get uh, queries per second higher than memcache with this. Um, so they're, you know, you just, you're doing very simple, you know, one, you know, on the prime, doing stuff on the primary key, um, you know, insert or updating or deleting one row or reading a single row. Um, it's great for just having, if you have tons of little stuff, just run it through handler socket and it'll do some of that stuff. Like one of the its optimizations is it'll write a few things to the database, um, but it'll do it all in one transaction. And so it'll wait for several queries, you know, or a certain period of time, and then it'll commit. And so only one transaction is happening. It's only writing to the database, updating all your indexes once. Um, so it's a lot more efficient. Um, replication. Who does replication in their server environments? Um, replication is a, it's a great thing. It's great for backups. It's great for reporting. Um, and it, it can be a good thing. Um, but it's not, it doesn't solve all your problems. If, you're, if you have too many writes, replicating isn't gonna help you. Because if you're replicating, all the writes are still happening at the master server. There are ways to do circular replication. I don't recommend them unless you really understand what you're doing. Because um, there's all sorts of things that you, problems you can run into doing that. Um, and then, uh, you know, you have to, basically you have to understand what's really going on. Uh, when you replicate, all your writes are happening on the master and the slave. And so you're not getting fewer writes. So if you have lots of writes, all you're doing is making them happen in two places. Um, on the slave, they're happening one at a time. It can't get that concurrency that you can get on your master. It's got to do them in order. Uh, because, you know, that's just how it works. So it's, uh, so it's doing them in order, one at a time. Um, and uh, you can end up with slaves that are, you know, if your slave gets a minute behind your master because it's just got too much to do, 
then what happens, you know, you have to understand what's happening uh, with your user experience. You know, what happens if they update their profile? A user comes onto your site, they update their profile, it writes it to the master, and then you read it from the slave. What if the slave's a minute behind? They're going to say, you know, they're going to be mad at you because it looks like you didn't update their profile. They just went to all that work updating their information, and it looks to them like you didn't save it. Uh, the way we always solve this was we just use the map for their own information, we always use the master. So, in conclusion, be smart. Um, looks like we're finishing right about on time. Uh, so, know what your database is doing. Uh, use the tools that are out there to figure out what your database is doing. Uh, you need to know uh, if it's doing the right thing, if it's doing the wrong thing, what the bottlenecks are, um, especially if you're using an ORM because you have that abstraction uh, between you and the database, you need to know what your ORM is doing. You need to know what's going on. Uh, if you don't know what's going on, then there's no way uh, for you to fix it. There's no way to f for you to optimize it. Um, and so you have to be aware of that and understand not just what the queries are, but what they're doing, how they're interacting with your database. Uh, run, you know, run explain, run, run other, you know, anything else you have that'll help you to understand what's going on. You know, find the queries that are taking too long, find the queries that are happening too often, and figure out the best way uh, to, to deal with them. Um, break things down into their component parts. You know, look at you know, what, uh, you know, what, what's the biggest bottleneck? That's how I always approach uh, issues. When you're trying to optimize a website, the first thing you do is figure out what the biggest bottleneck is. And that's what you address first. And understand the ramifications. When you want to solve something, it may sound great in your head, but when you actually implement it, it doesn't always work out so well. Um, so you have to understand, you know, like, like I said with uh, replication, you have to understand what, what are the real, it's not just a, a cure-all. You know, if you add an index, adding an index doesn't automatically make your query faster. You have to understand what's really going to happen. Uh, what, how is it going to change? You know, is the index, the lack of an index a problem? Or isn't it? Is it something else? So, that's all. Uh, any questions? Yes? Um, it's, uh, I'm not morally opposed to storing binary data in a database. I mean, depending on how big it is, it doesn't always make sense. Um, I store binary data in the database. Sometimes I, I try not to do tons of it. Uh, Generally, there are better solutions for storing images or you know large files or you know anything like that. Uh, you know, I wouldn't throw videos in the database probably, but you know, small like I store small, you know, under 4K uh, images in the database. Uh, the reason I do it is because it makes it easier for me to back it up. Um, I have, you know, I already have MySQL replicating to another server, and so that's off-site. And so, if something happens at my data center, I already have an offsite copy, you know, up to the second of what happened. But, but it kind of it kind of depends on uh, there. That's not happening frequently for me, and so it, you know, it's. It, Yeah, I mean, you have to look at what's the, you know, there. Like I said, there. Sometimes it's a good solution. Sometimes it's good enough. You just have to understand what what's really happening with it. So, yes. Um, I think I've seen at least twice like people using uh, SQL databases like where it scales uh, number of tables with the number of users or something like that, where it's sort of like an object oriented application of SQL. Uh, I was wondering if, if you've seen that before and 
or there's a limit to it gets if you have too many tables it causes problems yeah usually okay um, if you are I did run into this problem with uh, uh, MySQL back about 12 years ago um, on an ext2 file system because there's a limit to how many files you could have in a directory before it started slowing down with modern file systems that's not so much the case generally so I wouldn't worry as much about it so even now you wouldn't worry about it or I mean it's not I mean we were talking this was you wouldn't believe how I mean we had over this database we or over all of our databases we had about 25 million tables this isn't something normal people would do I wouldn't recommend it to anybody <laughs> um, it was what made sense at the time given what we had then uh, but I wouldn't I didn't think it was a a great solution we just were trying to deal with what we had um, I don't think I mean I it's better to understand I mean you need to be able to understand your data if you have too many tables it's going to make it very difficult to understand your data so anything else all right thank you very much